A hundred? A hundred freaking episodes of this? My goodness. Wow. I don't even have a cute little intro thing to do. I'm just flabbergasted and floored and other words that start with FL that talk about me being flummoxed. There we go. I'm, I can't even put it into words. I'm so happy where Potteros has come and the journey that it's been through and all of this. It's great because when I started making this show, I thought it was going to be like 36 episodes. Sometime early on in the show, I said it was going to be really short, but it developed so much more and the books became so much more to me and everything. And I'm just so happy with where it is. And so much of that is thanks to all of you. So you listeners have literally turned this into my job. Patreon is the main source of my income. I am not exaggerating when I say that you all who have supported the show have changed my life and made me accomplish my dreams, which is to have a job in comedy, and now I have that. And even if you haven't supported on Patreon, just by listening to the show, telling people about the show, rating it, showing up at live shows, conventions, whatever it is, you have contributed. So thank you. I owe all of this to all of you. So I really appreciate it. I'm not going to do anything different or special for episode 100. I don't want to break the rhythm that we've got going on with the movies, especially because we're only halfway through movie three. So let's just keep going with that. But I wanted to take this time to thank all of you for being a part of this journey. And also have a couple special announcements that I have been waiting for explicitly for episode 100 to make this a little more special. The first is that Potterless is going to have transcripts. I've been working with a listener, Kritzia. She's been transcribing the episode and I am going through with some of the different moderators of the Discord and the Facebook group right now to proofread those. Just getting a second set of eyes on it to make sure everything's all right. But what we're going to do is once those proofreads are done, start adding them to the episode page. So I'll be sure to give updates when certain chunks of episodes are ready. But basically, when you go to the episode page on PotterlessPodcast.com, it'll have the full transcript. So if you know someone that is hard of hearing or struggles with English or you just want to read along or control F to find a particular thing that I said or point that I brought up or a guest said in an episode in the past. Now the transcripts will be there. I'm really excited. It's something that Multitude has done a good job of is trying to make podcasts more accessible for everyone. And I'm happy to be joining some of the other shows that have done that. And uh, it's great. Also, there's going to be new merch, which I'm very excited about. Potterless is making Violently Purple merch. So we've got Violently Purple crewnecks and Violently Purple V-necks. I went through many iterations of merchandise suppliers and found the most purple shirt that I could. And we've added a violently purple design that Kelly helped put together with the original designs that Crystal Duke, who did all the lettering for Potterless, we put it together and made one that says violently purple. So those will be available for purchase once Multitude launches with our new merchandise provider. We're announcing that this week. So make sure you're following Potterless or Multitude on social media. Once we announce that new partnership, you can get the violently purple merchandise. And finally, we have those Potterless live opportunities coming up in November from November 15th through 17th. I will be in Atlanta, Georgia, and Potterless Live featuring horses. The opening act is going to be in Houston, Texas on November 21st. Those tickets are almost sold out, so if you want to go, go buy tickets before they sell out at bit.ly slash PotterlessHtown. You can get them there, and stay tuned on social media for Potterless to figure out about the Atlanta meetup, if we can do a Houston one, all of that. I'll be posting about that there as those dates approach. But again, thank you all for everything. I really appreciate it. And speaking of appreciation, we've new patrons. Welcome to the team. So shout out to Danny Wilcox, Vins, Casey York, Brittany Ratcliffe, Megan Bernstein, Lauren McKee, Gus Sloan, Lisa Maloney, and a name that was written in Hebrew that Google Translate tells me is pronounced Rotem Einat. Rotem, or whoever you are, please let me know how badly I butchered this. A pronunciation correction for Thomas Chavara and Javi Guadalupe Trejo III. A happy birthday to longtime producer Vicky Garcia. Shout out to Malin Potts, who upgraded their pledge. A huge shout out to Bugaboo and Jarl Sviven, who upgraded to the producer level status, as well as our new producer level patron, Haley Logan. They joined the ranks of Vicky, Aaron, Jesse, Natalie, Cloud, Frank, Marchismo, Samantha, Juan, Abid, Rose, Marie, Marie, Lisa, Romina, Kamel, Audra, Eleanor, Ross, Anne, Nikita, Taylor, Ali, Amelia, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Moster, Angelina, Caitlin, Grace, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Alex, John, Noel, Tao, Emily, Robin, Will, Liz, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Alicet, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Ivor, Naomi, Tyler, Summer, Heather, Vera, Carrie, Andrea, Ella, Anthony, David, Lisa, Lynn, Cameron, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Netta, Remy, Sarah, Nona, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Addie, Brian, Jenny, Nikki, Cara, Courtney, Kine, Amanda, Sabrina, Alicia, Kafir, Lindy, Martha, Benjamin, Sarah, Marta, Stephanie, Justin, Aaron, CJ, Eileen, Violet, Kat, Lindsay, Fielding, Keegan, Miranda, Gail, Mr. Folk, Adam, Christina, Maya, Zachary, Kieran, Heaven, Christy, Lily, Wire Warrior, Floor, Siri, Georgia, Itzel, Topher, Peter, Candy, Skyla, Adele, Professor, Threat, Kelsey, Lubin, Malaya, Lena, Daniel, Lee, 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 Elizabeth, Abby, Lika, Michael, Earmuffs, Kara, Tiffany, Kelly, Nadia, Carrie, Jamie, Camillo, Connie, Mary, Emos, 
Anastasia, Jaden, Nedry, Matt, Riley, Will, Zephyr, Brett, Samantha, Kayla, Lauren, Aurora, Emma, Hermione, Megan, Out of Context, Liam, Melena, Marcos, Ella, Hannah, Courtney, Victoria, Marie, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, Julie, The Meadows Family, Jennifer, Anna, Fake, Brianna, Karu, Teru, Sarah, McKenna, Six Awkward Nine, Anthony, Peter, Heather, Dead Cat Lady, Javi, Darlene, Brad, Thomas, Charlotte, Brianna, Kevin, Lori, Patrick, Chrissy, Alex, Steam Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never live in fear that they're going to say someone's name incorrectly, so instead they just say, What's up, man, every time they greet them? If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, exclusive merchandise, my notes, discounts on the merch store, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 100 of Potterless, covering the second half of the movie version of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, guest starring Jackson Bird and Rex Testarossa. <laughs> Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 27-year-old man who finally read Harry Potter books after a million years and now is watching the movies. My name is Mike Schubert. I am that grown man, and I am here to discuss the second half of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban with two lovely guests, one in the flesh in front of my face and one over the Internet. Over the Internet, we've got Rex Testarossa, an old Vine pal who now hosts a podcast called The Universe According to Rex and Jonas and is also apparently big on TikTok. Rex, how's it going? Hey, you know me, man. And I'm still out here doing my thing, thinking about this prisoner in Azkaban and how Harry Potter needs prisoner reform. But, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and in person, Truth. again, we have Jackson Bird, author of Sorted, Growing Up, Coming Out and Finding My Place, as well as noted Harry Potter nerd. Jackson, how's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. Now I've got that uh, prison reform in the Harry Potter world in my head. It's, <laughs> it's so true. Oh, my gosh. Someone's got over written an essay on that. All right, it's just, right. Yeah, Azkaban is not well run. No. <laughs> There's no, a lot of problems know. going on there trials aren't fair. that's what i was gonna say lack of trials is the biggest thing they have i've never understood why there isn't wizard csi that uses time turners just to observe crimes not interfere hmm. with them or change the past but just you would have thought that in this world where oh you, we think Sirius black murdered peter pettigrew and only his fingers left and all these muggles are dead too okay let's do this time turner and hide behind walls and <laughs> see what happened and then we can do a correct conviction or just use veritas serum you have it it's yeah uh, J.K. Rowling's come out against the Veritaserum saying something like, uh, I think it's similar to, what, what does the mind reading Snape does? I'm such a terrible fan. Oh, legitimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, you know, there are ways if you're powerful enough to make it not affect. Like, uh, you, you have to okay, kind okay. of be willing to be susceptible to Veritaserum. But man, that time turner idea, uh -huh. never thought of that before. And I think what they were going at, the justification for why Sirius got this unjust imprisonment is that they were just going for a conviction, yep. which... It happens in yeah, exactly. our world all the time. So that could be a very solid explanation of yeah. it's the equivalent of planting evidence or botching a trial just to get a guilty charge or plea or whatever you're looking for. So, yeah, it happens. Mm -hmm. So we picked up last time the Bogart scene had just happened and Harry is then taught by Lupin what's going on with his Bogart being a... Dementor and why that's actually good because the only thing that Harry fears is fear itself, mm -hmm. which is pretty sweet. So they get a nice little teaching moment there. But then later on, we get the fat lady painting being destroyed. Yes. And they change this a little bit because in the movie, you just have everyone crowded around the fat lady painting with a bunch of tears in it. And then she is in another painting hiding behind like a cow or something yeah. she's hiding behind some, some sort large of animal. large yeah. farm animal and she's naked or like, no. oh, or was she just wearing a crop? I guess. Yeah, I don't remember. Maybe she could be naked. Yeah, I just, it seemed strange. I don't know if she was or if it was just the framing of it. But I looked, I was like, why is it she wearing clothes? Maybe she's wearing a strapless <laughs> dress, but it's all different. And she's scared to go back to her painting. And it's different because you don't get the part which happens in the books where Sirius Black actually gets into the common room and has the knife over Ron's head mm -hmm. because he thinks it's Harry and then Ron is all terrified. You lose all of that in the yeah. movie. You just Although get... it's not because he thinks it's Harry. That's what they think he is. Oh, oh, right, because he was, yeah, the yeah, scabbers. Yeah, yeah. I always forget this. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> he was going after scabbers. But still, you lose all of the more dramatic serious nature of it in the book it's more oh my goodness freaking serious black had a knife and he was over one yeah, of the students it's this like is really super bad. scary and then in the movie it's just oh the painting kind of got torn up a little bit and he's in the castle now it just feels a lot lower of stakes yeah, yeah. 
It's like his calling card is like, ooh, destruction of property. I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, you get like it's it's more understandable why the fat lady is so upset in the book too because she also like failed at her duty like he got through somehow mm. and so i can understand her being even more traumatized with that not just like destruction of her painting i also realized as you were you were talking we talked last episode about how she's just like randomly singing and like trying to break a glass alfonso curran totally was just like it's not over till the fat lady sings. Oh, we gotta have this fat lady bleh. sing. You I know, some that's ah. what someone made that connection, and that's oh, why that happened. I hate it so much. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so then they go on to the Hogsmeade trip that Harry can't go to because his permission slip isn't signed. And you lose a scene which creates a continuity error in the seventh film. Oh. Because in the book, when Harry can't go to Hogsmeade, he stays with Lupin. And this is where Lupin does a little bit more of the teaching yeah. and telling him about stuff. And the first beast that he sees is a Grindylo, which Lupin was taking for their next lesson. And later on in the seventh film, when they're interrogating each other to figure out if they are actually people and not Polyjuice, oh, yeah. Lupin asks, what's the first creature that was in the corner when you visited my office in Hogwarts? And Harry says Grindylo. Now, you could say that this could have happened and you just didn't see it in the movie, but... Yeah. I like pointing out continuity error. <laughs> so yeah, so no Sir Cadogan is another thing that changes. And then we go on to Snape being the substitute fill-in right. for Lupin. And this is the iconic turn to page 394 scene. Which I did not realize until I rewatched it that like, that wasn't from the potions class. I like, yeah. Had, yeah, it's wild. So Snape is very insistent that they turn to page 394, says it three different times in this class, but the entrance that he makes is so good. And this is on brand for Snape. He did this in the first movie. He just makes an incredible entrance for the first ever potions class. And this time he just thrusts the door open, walks in at a power walk, uses his wand to close every single window in the classroom. And then he pulls down a projector screen. And <laughs> yeah. I, at first I'm thinking, what? He's not gonna. And then he does. He has a big old school projector that they use for slides. I'm sorry. You guys are fucking wizards. <laughs> what? In the second movie, Tom Riddle writes stuff in the air, writes his name, and just like, it's in the sky, and they need a projector? Really? Uh, but definitely not in the books. Why is this here in the movie? It just seems so unnecessary. You go to a magic school. <laughs> a, little, a lack of creativity. People being like, well, this is, what's, this is what classrooms are like, right? They got projectors. We got, uh, do they still have projectors nowadays? I was like, we did in the... N I, yeah, no, I th now I think they've transitioned to smart boards. Oh. Which yeah, I knew yeah. were making a way when I was in high school where you, they would hook up through HDMI port to a computer and then it's got a pen and you can draw and highlight and all this stuff. That is wild. They're really cool. My that sounds like magic. It, it's right. <laughs> they should have had smart boards. I had a math teacher that used to use one and he would show us cool stuff on it. It was one of my favorite professors, Mr. Fuchs. He would, before math class started, he would just grab his pen, get a big cup of coffee, and then turn to us and say, want to see something interesting? And then he would just do something that didn't even have relation to the lesson sometimes. One time he showed us how the quadratic formula works and why it exists, which was really cool because in high school, yeah. it's just you just learn the quadratic formula and then you just memorize it and then yeah. you just use it. But he showed us with geometry and all this other stuff and he used the smart board to draw things and make things animate and all this. And then at the end, he was like, that's why the quadratic formula exists. That's like the CNN like election night boards oh, where yeah. they like, move states around and stuff <laughs> minority report all the stuff going on that is what but no the uh yeah the technology of the the projector i feel like this movie tried to take on this almost like i don't know if like edwardian era steampunk is a thing because you got like the, you've got the victrola too that we were talking about last yeah. episode and so yeah there's you know the reason that they have like quills and stuff jk rowling always explains that parts of the culture and technology of the wizarding world are frozen in the time when the statute of secrecy was instituted in 1692. And so that's why like they still write with quills and parchment. That's what her explanation has been in Pottermore or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of breaks with that continuity here if they're using projectors and Victrolas. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, like Arthur Weasley, his whole job is finding these like muggle things that people have bewitched. So like there's gotta be, especially with like Muggleborns and stuff over the years, there's gotta be people bringing in this muggle technology. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just weird. Yeah, what's strange is that another part of the whole 
thing of Hogwarts is that not all technology is supposed to work. So why is it that some does? Well, I think they're probably both bewitched and not running on their uh, normal tech. But okay. doesn't he change the projector with his wand? Oh, I, I could be so. making that yeah. up. I don't no, know. I guess no, no, I, th- I think that he might. He should. But yeah, it just it just uh, it just seems very unnecessary. <laughs> they're going for a certain aesthetic here. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> But there are so many things about this particular classroom scene that they changed. They changed what Harry said slash did to get points deducted from Gryffindor. They changed the things that he says back and forth. In the book, he asks repeatedly, where's Lupin? That doesn't really happen in the movie. Then Snape in the movie he talks about the difference between an animagus and a werewolf. But that isn't in the book. Oh. In the book, it's just only about werewolves. Yeah, I think they ask like a, a true wolf and a werewolf in the book. But, mm-hmm. you know, I got why they had to do this because they don't talk about animagi right. ever otherwise. Mm-hmm. And they kind of have to bring it up because of Peter Pettigrew. I think it's McGonagall teaches animagi their third year in Transfiguration when she shows what she is. But like, yeah, if you're not including rest of the marauders plot there's really no other way to squeeze it in yeah 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 because i don't even know what the marauders are so the see (laughs) so the marauders is the name for lupin sirius peter pettigrew and james potter harry's dad who are all friends all gryffindors when they were in school at hogwarts and those four are the four that made the map the marauders map which they in the book explain this and they just never do in the movie is that the names that they give you which is mooney padfoot prongs and wormtail wormtail so wormtail is rat so that's pettigrew and then mooney is like moon werewolf that's lupin prongs is like the antlers on a stag so that's james and then padfoot dog serious and the whole thing is that because Lupin was a werewolf, the rest of them decided that they were going to become animagi, which means you can change into an animal at will to support him. It was like a gesture of friendship. And they all did it in secret because in the wizarding world, if you are an animagus, you're supposed to officially register with the ministry so that they know. And it's a whole interesting plot that gives you more insight into why Lupin and Sirius are important, why it's mm-hmm. so devastating that Peter Pettigrew betrayed James Potter, all this other stuff, more backstory, why the map is cool, more intrigue here and there, and it's just completely gone from the movie. Yeah. Which is sad. Because that sounds way more interesting than just, oh, he's a rat man, he's a piece of shit. Yeah. He betrayed everyone. Like, you could have explained it, but I guess he didn't have time. No. That would have been cool to know, though, shit. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I think especially knowing that, like, Peter was so close to Harry's parents. Because we see him freak out when he realizes that Sirius was that close, but mm-hmm. we don't ever, it's never really explained, like, Peter was part of it, too. And he betrayed them just as much as Harry thought that Sirius did. Um, but also, yeah, they are just, like, cool. They're basically, like, the Fred and George of the 70s. <laughs> and so it's fun to imagine, like, the stuff they would have gotten up to. It's a shame. And... This is what always bums me out is when they add scenes or draw things out is you take away the ability to put in some interesting stuff. And I think Mm -hmm. the Marauders, I I think it's just a big lost element. And I think that's why so many people, when anyone is asked about what kind of spinoff or prequel would you want? I think the reason so many people say the Marauders, one, is it's interesting. But two, is because they weren't given any sort of justice Mm -hmm. in the movies. And it's not like they were incredibly drawn out and explored in the books, but it's enough where you get a sense of who they are, their friendship, what they stood for, stuff like that. Yeah, and you know, you were saying people like Sirius a lot more than Lupin. I think you understand a lot more of Lupin's background if you understand that. Mm-hmm. Certainly like Rex hearing your your take on Peter Pettigrew, like that's really enlightening of how people could not quite get that whole thing. And it also plays into Snape's relationship to, to Harry. And like, I mean, Snape is like the crux of this whole series in many ways. And a lot of his perspective comes from being bullied by the marauders yeah another thing you learn rex in the books is that snape was in slytherin when all these four dudes were in gryffindor and they were at odds those sides bullied each other back and forth so that explains why when snape comes in he's so happy and says oh i'm so glad i hoped it would be me that could catch you because he hates Sirius because Sirius used to pick on snape and then you get more insight into why snape hates james potter because there's this whole thing this whole story of how there was the Whomping Willow and Lupin was a werewolf and they explain everything about how the 
other kids would take care of him and put him in the Shrieking Shack on the nights where a full moon was out so that he wouldn't attack people. But then there was the one night where they tricked Snape into going in there and then James had to save him and then Snape despised James because he saved his life and everyone heard about it and all this other stuff. So there's so many things left out that make the relationships of all the characters make sense. And you still get the actions happening, but you lose all of the emotion behind them of why this is important or significant because i always thought snape's hatred came from like just because he was was his harry's mom named lily lily mm-hmm. yes i thought it was just stemming from lily i didn't, i knew there was probably some bullying but it's never really gone into so this is interesting to learn the basic trajectory is that in the books you at first think it's the bullying and then you later learn it's the lily stuff and in the movies it just seems like snape is kind of curmudgeon and then it's the lily stuff so in the books i think it's a little more fun because you think it's like, okay, wow, they really just were rivals in school, whatever, blah, blah, blah. They didn't like each other because Snape got bullied or he wasn't good at Quidditch and James was or whatever. And then you learn, oh no, it's the Lily stuff. But then in the movie, it's just only the Lily stuff, which is fine. And that's the true answer. Mm -hmm. But I think you lose on the extra element of it. Yeah. I mean, it's funny as you're explaining it all. I'm like, there's so much like I get why (laughs) it's not in the movie. But then the same time, you're you're right. Like I have for so long, just like not loved the movies because I felt like they just lacked the depth and just didn't get anything quite right. And what has never occurred to me until now is I think it's not having those underlying reasons of why things happen by not showing that you're losing a lot of the depth of all of the characters. And that just loses some of the power of the storytelling. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's hard with just making it one movie for the book. And yeah. I don't know why, how I would have. Yeah. <laughs> this is why everything is turned into TV series now. This yeah. is why it's multiple episodes, multiple seasons, whatever it is. And yeah, when Harry would, Potter TV series. I would jump on that Harry Potter TV series so quickly. You don't understand. That would be all over there. Yeah. They're going to get it done at some point and then it'll be very good. And then they'll be able to explore stuff more and it'll all make more sense. But until now, we're just... We've got what we've got, so let's move on. (laughs) Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Long tangent. Another thing in this class that's different is that Malfoy draws a gif (laughs) on a (laughs) on a piece of paper of Harry losing Quidditch and blows a swan of the note that flies over to Harry, which is pretty cool. But this is completely added in, but it's fun. So then we get to the actual Quidditch match, and they change a little bit here. One thing I do appreciate is that in the movie, they make it a very quick Quidditch scene just to kind of get the point (laughs) across. Whereas in the first two movies, they really made them big and a more focal point of the movie. So I appreciated that they had changed that. They kind of don't show a whole lot of other characters in this. They don't show you Cedric Diggory at all yeah. because he's the opponent. They're playing Hufflepuff. You really only see Harry. You see Katie Bell get a, I don't know if she's the one. Somebody's broom gets struck by lightning oh my gosh. and it burns up so just adding this other things. But one thing you do miss is something that's always bothered me in the books is it's really bad weather, but they got to play because it's Quidditch and they're wizards so they can't make a dome that blocks rain above it (laughs) so Hermione before the match starts goes to Harry and does a spell that repels water from his glasses Mm because he's just wearing his regular glasses and then in the book she never does that spell on his robes either which always bothered me so much you're already gonna do a repel water thing on his glasses do it to everything so he doesn't get wet but in the movie I do appreciate that he actually has goggles on which makes way more sense why doesn't Harry have a pair of rec specs why is he just wearing (laughs) his glasses up there and the goggles have become such a big part of like uh, Universal just sells them everywhere Mm -hmm. you know they're like a big part of cosplay and also in the original muggle quidditch with the international quidditch association uh-huh. it was a part of the uniform oh you had to wear goggles yeah, that's, in the first couple of handbooks that is beautifully excessive <laughs> yeah that, i mean that's what the quidditch association used to be was just like super eccentric and stupid ways they had capes as part of their uniforms they don't have any of that now they're very much jocks <laughs> <laughs> So the movie does a very dramatic rendition of the Quidditch scene where you're just flying around. Harry falls off his broom. I think it's actually really well done. Mm. The book gives you a little more insight into it. You know that they lost. You get to know that Cedric grabbed the snitch, all this other stuff. Whereas in the movie, you just learn after when he wakes up in the hospital wing and Hermione has to explain to him what happened there. So one of the next scenes is the twins giving Harry the Marauders map, which is really good. And later on, you get to a point where 
Lupin is talking to Harry about the Dementor thing and all of that after the Quidditch thing. I don't remember this before or after, but I wrote down a quote where Lupin, and when he's talking to Harry about it, says, quote, I don't pretend to be an expert, Harry, which I think is very interesting given that you're the defense against the dark arts professor. <laughs> you should be an expert. I would hope that you are. <laughs> there has never been a defense against the dark arts teacher who is an expert. <laughs> Maybe Snape. Yeah, he's it's, probably yeah, the only fair, one. fair. Uh, so I think then you get the twins giving him the map scene and then you get the shrieking shack scene where they mess with Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle. They change a little bit of things. It's not Crab or Goyle. It's just a third person. I forget which one it is, but one of the three is different. Was it this early on? I know one of the kids got fired because he smoked weed. Uh, he was, was growing this? weed. He was growing weed? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is way more intense. I know. Uh, I had the same thought when I was rewatching. I was like, it can't have been this early, can it? Um, I think both of the Crab and Goyle actors are in this one because like, okay. the very first scene in the great hall that like first scene where we see them in the great hall when like draco is fake fainting mm -hmm. i saw the third dude first and i was like wow was it that early but then i saw the other crab and or goyle yeah it's just a third person that isn't it which i guess is convenient that they introduced this third crony <laughs> before they really needed him well because later on they don't do the third crony they just have zabini be in it instead oh, of crab okay. or, or goyle let's see I guess. Um, no, it's crap. Okay, I'm on the Wikipedia page for Jamie Waylett, who is in six of the eight films. So, oh. Legal Troubles. On April 7th, 2009, Waylett and a friend were pulled over by police. The officers searched their vehicle, finding a knife and eight bags of cannabis. Wow. Other images on the camera led police to Waylett's mother's house, where additional cannabis plants were discovered being grown. Waylett was charged a month later for possession of the drug. He appeared in court, pleaded guilty to growing the plants in his mother's home, but claimed that they were for his personal use and not for distribution, because that's how weed works. <laughs> and then he was sentenced to 120 hours of community service. He had previously been accused of using cocaine in 2006. And then in 2011, this is after all the movies, he was arrested for his participation in the 2011 England riots. Oh. He was charged with violent disorder, having an article with the intent to destroy property and receiving stolen goods. He was conf oh, he was accused specifically of possessing a Molotov cocktail. Oh. What the fuck? <laughs> Oh, wait, and then he got charged for growing cannabis again. Oh, my gosh, dude. Dude, he's just a criminal. He was perfect for and the role. And then he only got sentenced. <laughs> he, he only got sentenced to two years in prison, which feels like not Ooh, enough. That's a really light sentence for, for eight repeat bags offender. of weed. Yeah. And then growing Wait, no, he didn't even get prison time for that. He just, yeah, got he just did community service. Community service. What the well, fuck? Uh, I got bonkers. England, man. I'm glad I looked that up because I always thought it was he just smoked weed and then got fired, which is like, come on, guys. You yeah. Know what I mean? well, be, uh, but that's a little more intense. Yeah, he did a lot. <laughs> so the lesson we learned here is move to England if you want to do crime. You'll get away with it most <laughs> yeah. of the time. Or be white. <laughs> Yeah. That too. <laughs> do both. If you yeah, they, do, do both. Just you cover white, all your bases. To England, you can do whatever the fuck you want, apparently. Hey, it's me editing, Mike. I did dare in middle school and i don't know what past mike is talking about here you need to say no to drugs and especially growing them looks like past mike must be hard on his time so let's make sure he doesn't have to resort to growing <laughs> weed in london by taking a break for wingardium and ridosa Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by HelloFresh. Let's say hypothetically that you can't go to Hogsmeade because you didn't get your permission slip signed, and all your friends are going, and they're talking about all the great food that they're going to eat from Honey Dukes, and the tea they're going to drink from Madame Puddyfoots, and you're getting really hungry and sad on your own. You want to make some delicious food to eat. How are you going to do it? You're going to use HelloFresh. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality, regardless of your comfort in the kitchen, even if you're a 13-year-old boy who's only ever cooked breakfast for his bratty cousin and his aunt and uncle. And there's many meal kits to choose from, but HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other one. So you know that you're going to get something delicious every single time. They have over 20 seasonal chef-created recipes each week, so you can break out of your dinner rut and make sure that you're not cooking the same stuff over and over and over again, which, as someone that gets comfortable in the kitchen, you can fall into that trap. So HelloFresh helps you expand those horizons. HelloFresh knows that sometimes you got to change things up. Thankfully, they're flexible. You can easily change your delivery dates, your food preferences. You can skip a week, whatever you need. Recently, I made a HelloFresh recipe for Korean Bulgarian 
bulgogi beef tacos, and oh man, they were so fantastic. I make tacos a lot, but they're usually Mexican-inspired flavors, so this was really nice for me to make a format of food that I'm used to, but with different flavors and spices, and I really like it, and I'm gonna start making it more in the future. And if this sounds interesting to you, you're in luck because we've switched up the HelloFresh deal for limited time only. You can get nine free meals with HelloFresh. Nine free meals if you go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless9 and enter code Potterless9 at checkout. Again, HelloFresh.com slash Potterless9 and enter code Potterless9, the number, at checkout. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless9, enter Potterless9 at checkout, get those nine free meals, and make some food that your friends are going to be jealous of. It's better than stuff you can buy at Honeydukes today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Wix. Let's say hypothetically that you just escaped from a high security prison and you are trying to get the word out there that Peter Pettigrew is actually evil and he's the one to blame for Voldemort coming back, murdering James and Lily Potter, etc, etc, etc. But how are you going to spread this information? You're going to make an amazing and stunning website with Wix. Wix makes creating your own custom website an absolute breeze. They've over 400 templates to choose from all different styles for whatever you're going for, from portfolio stuff to music to videos, to pictures of things, to a food blog, whatever, you can pick their templates and then customize the colors, the fonts, the layouts, fun effects, cool little features that you can add, like scrolling wallpapers and animations, all this fun stuff. You can really toy around with it. I've played around with lots of features and it's a fun time. Updating and managing a site with Wix is also incredibly simple, which is nice because I've used Wix for the Potterless site, for the horse site, and my personal website. And I have <laughs> talked about that personal website a lot. And there were weird issues that I didn't realize. I didn't change the font color on the mobile version of the website, so it was blue on blue and you couldn't read anything. I also had a link that didn't work, and people emailed me, hey, your website isn't working, and it was very easy for me to go, log in, switch it, and make it functional. So Wix makes updating and editing your website an absolute breeze, as well as creating it. And if you're worried about it taking a lot of time, A, it doesn't, but B, you don't have to worry. There's no limit on the free trial. You can take as much time as you want, and then if you want to upgrade to premium and get new features like custom emails, a custom domain, all sorts of fun stuff like that, you can can, and as a Potterless listener, you can get 10% off if you go to potterlesspodcast.com slash Wix and click the link. So when you upgrade to premium, you'll get 10% off. So again, potterlesspodcast.com slash Wix, click the link, upgrade to premium, get 10% off, and get the word out there that Peter Pettigrew is actually scabbers today. Finally, today's episode of Powderless is brought to you by Shaker and Spoon. Let's say hypothetically that you just escaped from a high security prison and you revealed that Peter Pettigrew is actually scabbers the whole time and then you had to wrestle a werewolf who's also your friend and then you had to escape on an animal that was supposed to be killed and all this other stuff and you just need to relax and wind down at the end of the day with a nice cocktail. How are you going to make this nice cocktail? You're going to do so with Shaker and Spoon. Shaker and Spoon is fantastic. They are a service that will send you ingredients to make four drinks out of three different recipes, so 12 total drinks, and all you need to do is supply the alcohol. They give you all the mixins from syrups to spices to fruit to crystals of ginger, whatever the recipe calls for. They're going to send to you. All you got to do is supply the liquor, and you can make some fancy cocktails. I always enjoy doing the boxes from Shaker and Spoon because even though it's one alcohol, you will make three very different style of drinks. I've done tequila ones where one was savory and one was spicy and one was citrusy, and that's very fun. It's always fun as a party to do. Have some friends over, make these drinks, taste test them, look how fancy I am. I've made drinks, but they just give you the instructions and they make it so easy. If this sounds interesting to you, you are in luck because as a Potterless listener, you can get $20 off your first box if you go to shakerandspoon.com slash Potterless. You'll get $20 off and the boxes are between $40 and $50, so that's about 50% off, which is great. And all you gotta do, buy the liquor, take the box, make some drinks, look fancy. So again, shakerandspoon.com slash Potterless. Get $20 off your first box and start making fancy drinks to wind yourself down after you've had a week today. They change a couple other things here. Hermione is at this scene, and then in the books, it's just Harry and Ron, and they throw snowballs in the movie, but in the books, they're throwing mud at all of them, which I think is a little more fun. <laughs> it's a little messier. They basically just hybrid two Hogsmeade trips together mm-hmm. into one, so they combine this trip when you first see the Shrieking Shack, but you don't know what it is. You then have the other Hogsmeade trip, which happens in the same one in the movie where Harry learns about Sirius's backstory a little bit, him being his godfather when he overhears the teachers at the Hogshead yeah. talking about it. So they just kind of smush these together, which I think makes sense. It's just you're going to go there twice. You might as well just go there all at once. Yeah, mm-hmm. they do all of that. Harry learns. He goes into the back room again. This is done a little bit differently where Harry under the cloak sneaks into a back room where Fudge, McGonagall, Rose Murta, 
and m- maybe a couple other people are talking about Sirius's backstory and learns about the Godfather stuff. Harry storms out. I think Daniel Radcliffe's acting gets a little bit better in this one, but I did really think when he screams, he was their friend <laughs> when he <laughs> learns about Sirius. It was, it was really funny. He was so mad. <laughs> I forgot until I watched this back that I think this is probably the movie that generated the most memes. Uh-huh. It's the like second one a lot, one. too. The oh, second yeah? one's a lot of Twitter gifts uh, that are very popular, oh, yeah. but this one I think might have the most memes. Because you've also got later Sirius Blacks like uh, I, I've been waiting 12 years or whatever uh-huh. like that was yeah, that was yeah. a big thing years ago also you get the expecto patronum gif which people have placed over the dub where it says it's pinned to my scrotum where if you do lip, <laughs> lip reading of harry delivering that line it kind of looks like he's saying that instead oh, which is always a fun time so later on you get the lesson the one-on-one of lupin teaching harry about expecto patronum and everything and First gives a little coaching, opens the chest, the bogger comes out, and Harry passes out. Lupin gets him to come back, and he says to him, which I hope was an intentional word choice, he says, I didn't expect you to get it on your first try, (laughs) which I was really waiting for him to turn to the camera and go, "Eh?" (laughs) I didn't expect you to... So then later on, we get to the scene where Harry is reading the Marauder's map and he sees Peter Pettigrew walking around and then he goes out to look for him and then Snape is there. I feel like this was done differently in the book. I don't remember him seeing Pettigrew on the map. I feel like he just saw Snape and then was trying to figure out why Snape was roaming the halls. There, I mean, there was some point where I thought he, no, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, there have been so many things you've brought up where I'm like, wait, that <laughs> didn't happen in the book? Because I think I've just remembered the movie so well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Snape is on the map. Is everybody on the map? Everybody's on the map, yeah. which is a bit of a confusing thing because... The reason that Pettigrew is on the map is because of Scabbers. Yeah. It does raise the concern of the twins have had this map for years uh-huh. and Ron has had Scabbers for years and Pettigrew's just been sleeping in Ron's bedroom all the time yep. and they never question him about it. So that was always an interesting plot device there that didn't seem to uh, to come through. Yeah, it's so fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> when the internet made that realization, I died. <laughs> So then we get to the point where Harry is going in the hallways. He thinks he sees Pettigrew. He walks past him. And then Snape comes up. Harry turns off the map and everything. And then Snape is trying to to get him to reveal what is this map? What is it doing? All this other stuff. And Snape at one point to Harry says, and I'm not sure if this quote is in the book, but I'm so glad that it's in the movie, is when he says, I was strutting about like your father used to. And then Harry goes, my dad didn't strut and nor do I. (laughs) (laughs) Look, you can make fun of me all you want, but how dare you claim that I strut? I'll have you know that I walk normally. (laughs) I do a normal walk like a straight man. (laughs) I do not put any pizzazz into my steps. I take normal steps like a regular boy. (laughs) This is not a jazz step, damn you. Damn you. I do not frolic. I do not skip. I do not strut. You have never seen me scamper. (laughs) So another thing that you miss out here is the time in which Harry receives the firebolt because there's no other Quidditch scene. Later on in the books, there is another Quidditch match, Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw, and Harry gets a firebolt. You get it from Christmas. He doesn't know who he gets it from. Later on, you learn that it's from Sirius. In the movie, they just never play Quidditch again. Yeah. So this doesn't happen until the end of the year. So they switch that a little bit. I get it. It makes sense. It's fine. Another thing that's downplayed a little more, it's a side plot that I think makes sense, but the Hermione versus Ron getting upset at each other for the Crookshanks versus... Mm. Mm, scabbers scabbers situation is definitely more played out in the book it's a bigger point of discussion and butting heads of the two of them and harry has to kind of mediate they kind of just throw that to the side which i support this yeah that plot twist always seemed excessive especially because crookshanks after book four they just kind of forget that crookshanks exists yeah what does crookshanks do past book four Maybe Chris Chris died. Even, <laughs> oh no. I've opened a door. Oh no. No, I mean, well, you know, this is another one where it turns out Crookshanks was actually like is part Neasel, and Neasels are a creature that right. has a lot of knowledge. Basically, Crookshanks was helping Sirius Black the whole time and mm-hmm. kind of knew something was up with Scabbers, and that's right. why Crookshanks was always trying to kill or 
kidnap scabbers. Yeah. So it's another thing where it's like, oh, there's this bigger meaning to it. And like, if that wasn't going to be in the movies, that's fine. And like, just right. showing them bickering instead of this whole like cold shoulder that goes on for chapters and mm-hmm. chapters and chapters. I agree. I think it worked. Right. It just seemed strange. I guess they did it minimal enough. But yeah, Crookshanks in the books later on becomes actually important because you learn that Crookshanks is able to make the Whomping Willow stop attacking Rex in the books. There's a way to make the Whomping Willow, if you touch a particular route, you can make it stop swinging so that you can go under that secret passageway that leads to the Shrieking Shack. And Crookshanks does that. And you learn that Pettigrew used to, when they would take Mm -hmm. care of Lupin, he would turn into a rat, scurry all the way there and touch it. So then Crookshanks does it. So Crookshanks is like a little more important in this book. But yeah, in the movie, they're just not. So it's almost like, why'd you even put him in at all if it, if yeah. you're not going to use any aspect of Kirkshanks? And it does just make it seem like Ron just really doesn't like cats? Yeah. Uh, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> just got some sort of prejudice all of a sudden. <laughs> So another thing that they change is that in the books, the Buckbeak trial is more drawn out Mm -hmm. in that there's a more dramatic lead up and build up to it ultimately being the death sentence in the movie, which is very abrupt where right away, boom, we've decided that they're going to be put to death. Whereas there's a part where Hagrid needs to go in for a trial. Yeah, I was going to I was going to say Buckbeak in the books got way more of a trial than uh-huh. uh, Sirius Black ever did. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> but there's even a part where Ron and Hermione try to help Hagrid in the trial and yeah. give him They're like legal researching advice. for yeah. months like yeah, becoming lawyers. It's a whole thing, which is fun because that's basically while Harry is having his one-on-ones with Lupin, Ron and Hermione are coaching Hagrid through how to best handle himself in the trial. And it's a really fun side plot. Again, I think it makes sense to get rid of it, but it, yeah. it was really fun in the book. I liked them going all lawyer mode. It felt very <laughs> my cousin Vinny-esque where they don't know what they're doing, but they're trying to figure it out. Later on, we get a scene where Hermione is in divination class Mm -hmm. and you get the part where Trelawney insults Hermione, which does happen in the books of her saying, oh, you just I could tell you never had this gift of it. And in the movie, she gets a little more upset about this remark than she does in the books. But. That is not the only thing that is different. The big thing that's different is the whole crystal ball Voldemort situation where Trelawney does the thing where she like has the out of body experience Mm. and goes in this very creepy voice where it's just like, oh, the the servant and the master will be reunited (laughs) and all of that. That came in the books later on. It was like when they were doing finals. Yeah. Yeah. It was right after Harry's final. Yeah. Yeah. So this happens a lot earlier. And again, I think you got to do it. Move the plot along. It makes sense. But a little thing that they change. But yeah, that voice. Voice? Oh, terrifying. Yeah. I don't know what kind of vocal effects they did, but it is straight up nightmare fuel. I bet it was all Emma Thompson. No, oh, just all natural. <laughs> She's so talented. God, her range. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> just a wonderful multi layered track. So there's another Quidditch match. The final of Quidditch is, again, just not in the movie at all. Then there's that Trelawney thing. And then later on, we're getting into the end of it where they're figuring out all this stuff. So. You get the scene where Draco and Hermione have a little yelling match with each other. And then I'm so glad they added this in the movies. I'm not sure if if they said this in the book. I feel like in the book she slaps him. But in the movies, she punches him straight in the face. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's another gif. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's such a good one. Such a good one. I don't remember in the books, but uh, were you at one of Tom Felton's interviews at Leaky Con Dallas? I was not. But you, but I wasn't either, but I heard. I, di- I didn't hear. I would love to hear about this, but I will say just on a quick note is that me and Melissa were doing a thing about the room of requirement, and it was right before Tom Felton's concert. And uh. already the main stage was pretty fill out, and I felt really good about myself. This is my first time being on the main stage. <laughs> <laughs> at convention the seats are pretty full i was thinking all right this is pretty cool and then more and more people started going in i was like okay this is pretty sweet and then we had about five minutes left and a rush of people go in and i go okay who's on after us <laughs> <laughs> and it was the tom felton concert I was, yeah. ah, of course of course of course but hopefully in those last five minutes i made a really good joke and everyone's like who is this potter yeah this did guy? you see like a surge in subscribers after that? Uh, I mean, definitely after leaky con there was a lot but yeah I, i've got to see hour by hour breakdown <laughs> 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 if there was a big spin. But no, what did he say about the so, punch? And, and maybe he said this some other time. I don't know. It was the first time I heard it. But basically, so when they were shooting, she didn't actually punch him. It was like stage punching, whatever. Okay. But when they were rehearsing beforehand, I think, you know, the director was maybe just trying to get them to really get into it, show aggression. And she just like, 
like open hand slapped him super hard Ooh. and he was like it actually hurt and like left marks Damn. so no she didn't actually punch him in the shot but she hit him she hit him pretty hard <laughs> that's great the more and more i learn about tom felton the cooler he seems something yeah. that i pointed out in the second movie is that he has a great line where ron and harry are under the polyjuice potion described as crab and goyle one of them says oh I, I read this in a book when they're trying to justify things and tom felton as malfoy says read i didn't know you could read which apparently was a completely improvised line oh nice <laughs> which is fantastic and if you watch the movie he's talked about it he said that he forgot his line so he just said that and then they said no 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 keep it but if you watch that scene you can see if you just look at tom felton's face that he's made the face of oh shit what's my line <laughs> like for a split second you see his face kind of drop and then he says it so yeah i learned that and that's wow. so cool so yeah i gotta talk to tom felton now i mean he also just seems like a genuinely like pretty cool dude he does so but he's busy and important tom and, felton come and, on the podcast come on tom, yeah. come, come on the show i think he's gonna be at leaky con orlando so i'm gonna see if i can like make something oh happen. you should you absolutely talk I'll to try him i'm gonna i'll talk to programming be like you know who'd be a great guest for potterless live <laughs> tom felton <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be like yeah no no shit <laughs> <laughs> like every other podcast every asked. other person has asked <laughs> no but i'm special i didn't read the books remember so <laughs> then we get on to the point where there is the apparent execution of buckbeak something they add to the movie is when you think that buckbeak has been beheaded hermione kind of starts to cry and hugs ron mm -hmm. and then harry waits a beat or two and then awkwardly hugs her too yep. which i know that harry doesn't actually end up having feelings for her but it just feels so third wheel oh yeah high school uh it was uncomfortable biggest third wheel moment <laughs> my skin was just crawling <laughs> But that's just not in the books at all. There's none of that. <laughs> Again, they also just take out Ron being brave and stuff. Yeah. In the books, Ron is a lot more brave and heroic of the whole situation with them trying to figure out the Buckbeak thing and, and all the stuff that comes up with when Sirius is around. And they kind of just take all of that and put it onto Hermione. Yeah. Ron almost seems like a complete non-factor mm. in the movie here, which I guess makes sense because it is Harry and Hermione that do the time turner thing because Ron's leg is broken and stuff. But it, it just the more movies I see, the sadder I get that Ron just is done so dirty. They just kind of ruin all the fun Things that make him competent. I don't know. It's sad. They kind of make him a sniveling coward after a while, too, compared yeah. to like the first yeah. movie where he's like, oh, I'm going to play wizarding chess and possibly die. Yeah, that's a really great point, actually. He's super brave as an 11-year-old, yeah. and then yeah. they just kind of... And, you know, when they do put some of his stuff on Hermione, like I think she comes, as the movies go on, she comes across as like more infallible. Which is not true to the books. We see a lot of the times where she does mess up. Spew is a great example of not quite understanding things. Um, but also, like, just in terms of, like, representation of women, I feel like there was that kind of 90s era of, like, well, yeah, we're going to have a, a female character and she's going to be perfect and powerful and everything instead of having, like, a human accurate representation. Yeah. And it makes sense of why people who see the movies think that Harry and Hermione should have yeah, been together. Because yeah. Ron just doesn't seem worthy at all yeah not <laughs> at all just not doing anything so it's a bummer i'm i'm i i feel more strongly for ron now i i still liked him in the books but i think because he was poorly represented in the movies i like him even more just out of <laughs> because of the apparent disrespect for him yeah hashtag justice for ron justice Love for it. ron justice for ron so then we get to the actual shrieking shack scene which i will always say is my favorite chapter slash set of chapters in the books and it's just not well done in the movie it's so quick and so abrupt because you have none of the marauders backstory you don't understand the significance of everything nope. and they just change a whole the whole lot of details so ron does get dragged into the things by dog version of sirius and then harry and hermione chase after him that's all the same but in the book you have sirius stealing ron's wand and then using it mm. which i think is a little more interesting and then later on lupin disarms harry that is kept the same 
But I don't know. It's just overall, the scene made me really sad because this is the point when I was reading the books where I really fell in love with the series. When I mm. started the podcast, I thought I was just going to be making fun of the books. The bigger point of the podcast when I first started was I'm going to be an adult and have different approaches and realize things that people ignored as kids. And I thought it would just be all funny. And then now I'm obsessed with the books and I love them <laughs> and I care very deeply about all the characters. But this is where I twisted. And if you listen to the podcast, you can hear this tonal shift of me being kind of grumpy and. Uh, these books are overrated to once this chapter came it was oh wait these are really good huh. JK is really good at writing and these sets of chapters are what really did it and the movie just botches it it's just so quick and there's no depth and, and yeah ugh. I mean you you reminded me of something I haven't thought of in a long time which was you know back when the books were still coming out like around Goblet of Fire was out or the Phoenix came out uh, I remember getting asked every now and then by like friends or like parents who were like you know we want to start the series do we need to can we just jump in on the latest one and i used to always tell people you can't start any later than the third book because mm -hmm. there's a huge twist that changes everything it's valid and i haven't thought of that in years but like when the series was still coming out that was my impression of it was the serious black surprise and what you find out at the end like that's just where it all changes and you can't pick up any later than that i would agree I would uh, yeah agree. I, like i'm not positive if i still agree with that but no, i forgot that i used to think i that. mean when, I, when people tell me i'll often get when i'm at conventions or whatever people will say that they're trying to convince their significant other to start reading the books and my podcast helps because it's <laughs> someone who really didn't want to read them reading them and i always tell people if you just get through the first two and start reading the third you're mm. not going to want to stop because the yeah. ending of the third is so good but yeah you I, maybe i could just start telling people just read spark notes for the first two yeah. and then just start with the third and then if you want to go back you can yeah because <laughs> then once you're you're finished if you want to go back to uh the first two you'll have a different appreciation for yeah. it because, yeah. you know, I feel like oftentimes we're like, you know, whatever the first two. But if you go and do a reread, you sometimes are like, oh, no, it is still pretty good. Mm -hmm. Rex, didn't you say you only read the first two? You did this. You did this wrong. You did the opposite. of. <laughs> I was like, you know what? This is cool. I'll just watch the movies. <laughs> I kind of regret it now because the way that you're describing it is very similar to a thing that I mentioned on the, the previous episode, which is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, which is mm. like eight parts long. Oh. And people will tell you, hey, if you want to get into JoJo, just start at part three because that's where it picks up. But okay. like part one and two are important too, but like you don't really, you know, just gloss over that shit. You go straight to part three. Yeah, well, it's never too late. The books are easy to read, so <laughs> you can pick it up if you want. But they're good. They're like they are good. Shoobs, I am illiterate. You know, I can't read nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's why every time we text you, only send audio messages the whole time. <laughs> hey guys, I can't read or write. I'm just gonna say it. Okay. <laughs> And it's always like an emoji videos of you. <laughs> Just my tongue out the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they change a whole bunch of stuff in the scene. But one thing that I thought was really funny is they have these doors in the background where they go into the shack and the whole scene, they're moving in and out and opening and closing. There's not a lot of wind going on. The doors, they have to be made of paper. Like they are so <laughs> light in the background. Go back, watch this scene. It's just, they keep moving with like no wind of anything else. No one's robes are moving in the wind, but the doors just keep swinging at different directions and intervals. I thought it was really funny. I wonder if that's another like, you know, the filmmakers casually read the book and were like, oh, the Shrieking Trek is haunted and didn't ever piece together. No, it was a rumor that it was haunted yeah. to protect Lupin. <laughs> it's not actually haunted. <laughs> So we get the scene where eventually everyone shows up. So at first you have Sirius with Ron and his leg is broken and then Lupin comes in and the movie does an effective job of at first you think Lupin is evil, which yeah. I think is a really fun twist. And then eventually you learn, oh, no, Sirius is good. But then Snape comes in and Lupin does Expelliarmus to Harry. His wand just goes flying and that's it. But then eventually Harry gets his wand back and he does Expelliarmus to Snape when Snape is about to kill serious or it seems as so and snape goes flying across the room into something uh. a canopy falls on top of him and then they just leave him there they just when they eventually leave the scene after you learn all of the reveals of peter pettigrew and how he was the evil one and he betrayed them and all this other stuff they just kind of leave snape i remember in the books they used a rope spell to mm -hmm. tie him up and he at one point gets knocked out and then they carry him out of there while he's unconscious. So yeah. they sort of like levitate him out. Cause I remember yep. Sirius keeps like 
casually letting the spell slip a little so that Snape floats up and hits his head on the ceiling yep. as they're walking. <laughs> it's so a great many, detail. So many details that are just left out. So yeah, they just like leave and then there's just no Snape. I guess he just wakes up and gets out of yeah. there eventually. But all in all, the scene was just so rushed and yes. it made me really sad. Everything was just so quick and I think it's one of the more interesting scenes in the whole book series and that just bummed me out a whole bunch it's also very difficult to understand even in the books yeah. i mean okay the first time i read it i was nine so <laughs> it, was, it was very difficult to understand but i've i've always felt like it's one of the many moments in the series that is probably a uh, pretty freaking confusing if you haven't read the book yes and especially not even just not if you've read the book but also because the movie has given you no backstory about the marauders mm -hmm. so how are you supposed to know anything yeah it's uh, I, you lose a lot and they do it really quickly. Maybe that's why they did it quickly. It's because they had no backstory before. They had nothing else to flesh yeah. out. It almost feels like they kind of made this movie knowing that, oh, only people who watched or read the books are going to go see it. They'll understand. And then you got me sitting there like, huh, <laughs> what's going on? Huh. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, you would hope that they would try to make it apparent to everyone. And I think you still kind of get it, but it's so quick that it is not easy to fully grasp what's mm -hmm. all going down unless yeah. you have that background knowledge. They leave, they get out of there. And something that I found interesting here is that when Peter Pettigrew is the rat and then they turn him back into Peter Pettigrew, he is wearing clothes. And then later on, after they leave the scene, they oh my leave gosh. the shack and you get the whole werewolf scene, Peter Pettigrew gets a wand and turns himself back into a rat. But then the clothes are just left on the ground. Right. So what is the deal? Which one is correct? Oh my Which gosh. Which is wrong? <laughs> I would imagine that what makes the most sense is that... I don't know which one makes the most sense, but you can't, it can't be both ways. No, it can't be both. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want Rat to turn into Pettigrew and then he's naked. That's no, gross. No, no. So I would prefer it to be the clothes just kind of go with you and you always have clothes. But then why are the clothes left behind? It doesn't make any oh, sense. Terrible continuity. And oh my God. <laughs> I just want to think that he's clothed at all times and he used that as a distraction because... It just makes me a little uncomfortable knowing that Ron's been <laughs> right? a naked man his entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping oh, with him next to his pillow and everything. Yeah, you're right. It was a distraction. He transfigured some other clothes to be there, there it is. but he was still wearing his other one. <laughs> okay, yeah. So we'll do that so we can sleep well at night. <laughs> distraction, distraction. <laughs> I mean, hey, it is his MO. He did that with his finger. Wait, what? How he cut off his finger. So oh, you know? yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Yes. Okay, right, 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 right. Yeah, that's, there it is. Boom. He's just trying to keep people off the scents. He's, he's, a, he's a magician in our sense of the world. You, you gotta distract with one thing while you're doing the magic somewhere else. Peter Pettigrew is now David Blaine. He's a slippery little weasel. <laughs> <laughs> he is slippery. So then we get to the point where the moon is out, Lupin turns into a werewolf. And it's very interesting because in the movie, this transition is very scary and looks really good until the transition is done <laughs> because <laughs> while it's changing it's like oh this is really creepy this is really interesting it looks fun and then when he turns into a werewolf you just kind of think uh oh <laughs> that, yeah that's that's not what i was expecting he's got weird bowed legs very mr tumnesy legs yeah. <laughs> and just not what I was envisioning for a fur. werewolf. No. He looked very malnourished mm. for a werewolf. Yeah, thing. not a lot of fur. Awkward proportions. Yeah. On two legs. Werewolf on puberty, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> and not even teen wolf. Just it's, Yeah, it's the complete opposite of teen wolf werewolf. Yeah. The opposite amount of hair, for sure. Just, it was, uh, it was a strange look. It was a choice. Very, very interesting. So then he's there and you get the whole thing. And, and from here, they, they, they keep things like true to form for the most part, except for a, a couple little things. So you've got Lupin and Sirius fighting, which is the same and stuff. But then you have the howling on the side to distract Lupin, which mm. I do not believe happened in the books. No. I do not think Hermione being on the side going, oh, is how they did it. I don't think so. But now I'm like doubting myself. <laughs> <laughs> I like really want I need to reread this book now. Yeah, it's just, a, it's just a movie thing. It's only in the movies. It's not in the book at all. Weird. But anyway, they go in, into the point where Harry is chasing after Sirius and then all the Dementors come. And I think this scene's done really well. It's very dramatic with all the Dementors coming in, mm -hmm. and the lake getting mm -hmm. frozen over, and the Dementor kiss stealing the soul is fun. Yeah, but they're not giving him the Dementor's kiss. So right. that's very confusing yes. that they do that. Yes. <laughs> like, it looks cool. Mm-hmm. But it's 
not but it's what, not yeah. exactly you see his soul like coming out of his mouth yeah it's not exactly how it's supposed to be yeah but, uh, it does look cool but then something that's really interesting is that when the stag patronus comes the way that normally it is is that the patronus just kind of goes there and runs around and scares away all of the dementors but in the movie it does like a sonic boom of light oh and yeah it's just circular beams and rays like emanating from the stag coming away which i thought was a very strange look but i don't know they just had to show how powerful it was in this I, instance i, I guess. guess i thought it'd be cooler if you see the stag going around and hitting people with antlers <laughs> or something and launching them would be more fun but yeah. yeah we get the rings emanating which is very interesting so harry then passes out because of the dementor stuff wakes up in the bed and then this is where you get the reveal of the time turner and how yes. hermione has been doing everything so they go and they do the time travel scene and things are a little bit different here, like with the throwing of rocks and the werewolf thing, like we mentioned, but it's fine. It's no big deal. Like yeah. the time travel is already so messed up in general. Yeah. If anything, yeah. it makes it a little bit more clear. Right. Honestly. Yeah. And this is the one thing that JK Rowling has apologized for. She wrote a Pottermore article saying, uh, I really goofed the whole time travel thing. Didn't <laughs> I? And that's of all the things she's done. That's the one time she has apologized. Oh, man. <laughs> they go back they fix all of the stuff. And one thing that I really appreciate is you get to see this in the flashback is when Dumbledore is purposefully trying to waste the time of the executioners. Yeah. And I really enjoyed Michael Gambon. That's the name of the guy who mm -hmm. played Dumbledore. I didn't like him in the fourth movie because that's where he yes. yells all the time and he screams and he's way too loud. But I actually thought he was good in this one because he wasn't so loud and screamy. Yeah. And it was kind of funny, which I think a fun element of Dumbledore is that he is goofy and out there and says yep. jokes and stuff. And I feel like this portrayal in the third movie was a lot better and different than the fourth. Oh, I agree. And when I rewatched it this weekend, I had that exact same thought of just like, oh, he's not that bad. Oh, but remember the fourth one? He will be bad. <laughs> so the he does the whole like really long last name thing. Mm -hmm. And is the movie the first time that we hear his last name or is it in the book? The full name of Dumbledore? Yeah. No, you you learned uh, you learned it in the book. But I feel like it's a later book. Yes, it is. Because I remember watching yeah. the movie yeah. and being like, Brian, wow, they really went off like the boat with that no, one. That's... that's so not true. And then later his his name is in the book and it yes. was the same one. So I think they asked J.K. Rowling like, hey, we want to have his oh. full name or something. Yeah, because it was book five when they're at the trial. Mm. Uh, oh, yes. That's when he gives his full name. I'm pretty sure that they were making the fifth book or the fifth book had just come out when this actually, yeah, it was. Out. I think it was the same summer. I think you're right. Well, I think I'm wrong. Hey, it's me editing, Mike, letting you know that we were incorrect here. The movie came out in June of 2004. The book came out in June of 2003. Not exactly sure when it was filmed and all of that. So maybe there are some other stuff, but just wanted to get it on the record that it was not the same summer. So yeah, JK must have told them. That's really fun. Yeah. Or, I mean, I think it's probably possible that like the screenwriters maybe got an early early manuscript or something mm -hmm. and they were like well we got to take this bit i would hope that that's it and not the reverse it would be really sad if they wrote it in and then jk was like guys i gotta, <laughs> I gotta make his middle name brian oh my gosh i know i i hope that's it that's way better <laughs> that's so funny if was, she like she had written she'd written a completely was, different one brian's a very strong strong name oh yeah. is, it, is it is it rex brian is it, then why are you so scared of your true name listen brian because it's too powerful all right <laughs> it carries weight with it hey editing mike here real quick for context rex's real name is brian that's the joke just letting you all know why it was funny anyway back to the podcast yeah powerful wizards have that name albus is it is it Al his first name's albus right albus, albus percival wolfric brian dumbledore that's the one. Oh, nice albus. i'm recruiting you for my harry potter uh <laughs> trivia team now <laughs> assembling all I the smart like new yorkers i feel like i pulled that out of some unknown place in my head <laughs> it's just it's like riding a bike you never forget dumbledore's name that's true uh, but i do uh, you, you know michael gammon plays it so well where he's just like oh i must sign my full name oh it's such a very long name like he's just <laughs> really playing it up so another thing that's changed that isn't that different is when Hermione goes on to rescue Sirius by opening the door and, and unlocking it in the book. She uses Alohomora, which I feel like is more of a quintessential spell. And then in the movie, they use Bombarda, which was a spell just made up for the films. Oh, was it? Yeah. I kind of liked that she didn't use Alohomora mm -hmm. because Alohomora is the stupidest spell. <laughs> Why do keys exist if you have yeah, Alohomora? I, I, so, I agree. <laughs> so what I'm thinking is there's got to be locks that can't be unlocked even with Alohomora. And she probably assumed that this would be one of them because it's keeping someone prisoner. So uh, she just went, we're just going to break it. 
Yeah. Bombarda also sounds cool because it's yeah. you literally are bombarding in mm-hmm. and flying the door open. But this is always one that's interesting because Bombarda has seeped its way into more things beyond the movie. Yeah, like the it was in the Harry Potter stuff. iPhone game and some other stuff. So there's a couple things that people accept as canon now. And this is one that I think was really apparent. Uh, so, yeah, like uses Flipendo. Bombarda. Yeah, that's another one. Flipendo. It's never not in, in the, the books, books or movie. Or maybe yeah. not even in the movies. I it might be one of those ones where they use it in the movie, but all it does is just send people flying anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Classic movies. Yeah, they go through the whole time travel thing. They save Sirius. They get it all to work. It's fine. They change a decent amount of stuff when they go back afterwards, though. In the movie, Ron is already oh, yeah. awake when they go back in, whereas he was still asleep in the books. Also in the book, Harry goes to Lupin's office. Lupin tells him that he's resigning Mm -hmm. and that he is resigning because Snape told all of the Slytherins that Lupin was a werewolf. Dumbledore has to then tell Harry all of the complications of what's going on with Sirius of the whole like, yes, you saved him and he's good, but no one knows he is. Like, again, I think it's just the depth of all of the meaning behind things are kind of lost. It's just the actions. It's almost like they're going through the motions Mm -hmm. for the final scenes here. Um, And then here's a whole laundry list of of things that are different because... Lupin tells him a lot of things afterwards, uh, but Dumbledore had taught him some of these. There, uh, there's just so, there's like so much <laughs> that it just you learn. Like <laughs> Snape is never charged with revealing Lupin's condition and why he got fired, so you lose out on that. Mm-hmm. There's no mention of why Harry's Patronus is a stag because oh, you never yeah. get into the backstory and the animagus thing with James, so you don't really learn that. Though apparently I looked it up and that was in the original script. There was just like a deleted scene or mm. cut or whatever. But again, just like the whole Harry's Patronus being a stag thing is just completely lost. And then there's no ever talk about when Trelawney goes into the weird state where she just her eyes roll back and she says the prophecy. That's something that Harry talks about with Dumbledore. And in the movie, he just never brings it up, which feels like something you'd bring up if it sounds like your teacher's possessed. Like, hey, Dumbledore, Trelawney did this really weird thing. And in the movie, Harry's like, oh, Trelawney. Yeah. (laughs) She's so silly. You and your trances. (laughs) (laughs) And then finally, the whole... Thing where Ron gets the owl pigwidgeon from Sirius Black. Yeah, it's gone. sad that we don't have pigwidgeon. So pigwidgeon Rex is this tiny little owl that Ron gets. Sirius gives it to him to replace Scabbers because Scabbers was Ron's pet. So Sirius gives him pigwidgeon who is this tiny little owl with this really silly name. And I've always imagined pigwidgeon as being way too small to carry stuff. Yes. And I don't think pigwidgeon's in the movies at all. No, no. So, it's like peeves. Just not yeah, in. I was just really sad because I, I remember. Really something that goofy sounded <laughs> <laughs> i really want a pig widget. they later on they call him pig which is always fun i love when animals have names yeah that are different kelly and i my fiance we've talked about later down the road having a cat when we feel like we're ready to of course, be yes, responsible yes. and we want to get a cat adopt it of course we want to adopt a cat and then name it pomplamoose which is my favorite french word (laughs) it's the (laughs) french word for grapefruit Uh but i always thought was really funny but then we would call it moose for short so then we'd have moose the cat which is a great cat name but then people would be like oh moose and you're like what their full name is pomplamoose and then we'd be like (laughs) you're ridiculous i do feel a little sad because it was more fun until the pomplamoose flavor of Lacroix became so popular yeah now everyone will think you're now everyone will think i like Lacroix, which i hate Lacroix for the taste but then also for the frat bro connotation of it i feel but now that white claw exists i feel like Lacroix is gonna be extinct by the time this episode <laughs> releases it'll be fine i feel like white claw is just the pokemon evolution of one it's oh, like man. oh we have Lacroix. what if Lacroix had alcohol in it holy shit it, ju- it bothers me so much because i'm like i i'm a big fan of seltzer but like especially uh-huh. like if i go to a bar and i'm not drinking for whatever reason that night i want to get seltzer Seltzer's uh-huh. my like not drinking drink. It's mm-hmm. so weird to me that you would want to put alcohol in that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. White people got a party. This is Rex. This is our white culture. Is, yeah. is white claw. I, I've <laughs> learned a little bit about white claw uh, over the past couple of days, and I don't un- I don't understand you guys, but okay. I don't look. I don't understand us either. They do hey, taste. We had fine. our phases back in the day. We had four loco. Man, it was. Oh. <laughs> It was a wild time. Four Loco, I remember I was a freshman in college when Four Loco came out. Mm. And yes. people got destroyed by that. It was bad. It was so bad that I didn't drink until I was 21 just because a lot of my 
friends near me freshman year got destroyed mostly by four logo and i was just like you know what i'm already crazy and hyper enough as a <laughs> sober person i'm just gonna wait and then i got to skip all the bad alcohol phase because by the time i was 21 and drinking all of my friends had elevated to getting nice beer so it's like yeah. oh we're playing beer pong with lone star and not frio light H-E-B's <laughs> beer that costs 10 cents a can oh <laughs> man but also lone star was your good beer no well, that was for, that was, <laughs> the, was better not okay. the good drinking beer but if you're if you're playing beer pong with lone star it's like ah, oh, we've got a step above a step just above. the cheapest thing yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah people would have shiner at parties Yo, wait, 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 wait are you from texas i lived in texas for 10 years i did high school and college there okay i did are you from texas i am whoa what city uh grapevine where in uh, dfw okay yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah my sister lives in but Boston. i, I awesome. originally went to school near austin oh okay so there was lots of there was not much Shiner, actually. Really? Some loans. No, because we were we were freshmen in college. We didn't have Shiner. Oh, that's the nice thing. We idea. had the H E B beer. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I... Everclear mixed with Red Bull. Oh no. This was pre four loco days. We had to DIY uh, it. Oh my god, it was terrible. Yeah. You're so lucky you missed um, out. That's just like drinking lead poisoning. Yeah. <laughs> I never I got tricked into drinking it a few times. I didn't choose to look so kids out there, you can wait till your turn on a drink. Please you do. get to bypass <laughs> Drink the, responsibly. You let all of your friends make the mistakes of of having bad beer, <laughs> and then once you start drinking, your first beer will be nice. Yes. <laughs> and it'll be great. You don't have to suffer. I've never I don't know if I've ever had a keystone light. That's, or at least by choice. Yeah, that's like that's. <laughs> I've never been thing. to the point where the only beer available is. Keystone. You mean sweat the beer? So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, I've lost so many alcohol sponsors in the course of this episode. But <laughs> they weren't coming here anyway, so jokes on them. So then finally, they omit things which they always do at the end of the movies. Yeah. They kind of change. You never get Harry going back and seeing the Dursleys mm-hmm. and going back to King's Cross. They usually just kind of end. Well, yeah, that's it's pretty much the end of the film. But just I don't know. I was really sad with the ending because of the lack of pigwidgeon. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a really fun part in the book. Mm-hmm. And you just get how does even Harry even get the letter if it's not from pigwidgeon? He doesn't get a letter. Oh, he doesn't get anything. Well, the, he gets it, a firebolt. Oh, yeah, he yeah, gets yeah. firebolt and he flies off on it. So the very end, it like transitions for it's like they save Sirius. He yes. flies away on Buckbeak, and uh-huh. then next morning or, or no 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 Lupin so mm-hmm. then he leaves Lupin's office right. and he goes to the great hall where everyone's like there's a package for you Harry uh, and it's the firebolt and it doesn't have a note oh, it just no, has no, a no. feather that looks like Buckbeak's feather and Hermione like holds it up to him knowingly and they're like oh we know this is from Sirius but we're not gonna say anything to anyone else uh. <laughs> And I then he that. goes off and he rides okay. it and you get the free, freeze frame. In there. Yeah. Oh, the freeze frame. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> it's so. Uh. You lose out on the firebolt being important because yes. in those scenes that they don't show you where Harry's just having a good time at. Le- not what the fuck is it? At oh, LeakyCon. At- Harry had a great time <laughs> at LeakyCon. <laughs> at Diagon Alley. I would keep wanting to call it Hogsmeade. When Harry's having all the great time at Diagon Alley, one of the things is that he keeps going to the store where they sell the firebolt and looks at it every day and goes, oh, it's so cool, but it's so expensive. And I already have the Nimbus 2000. It's okay. And then his Nimbus 2000 gets destroyed. But uh, yeah. Oh, man. Mm. This ending, man, is frustrating. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's... uh, that's that's it. I also have a quote written down, quote, somewhere you can see the sky. Is that what Sirius says is where he's going to be? Oh, when he's talking to Harry about like, hey, maybe you'd want to live with me. I don't know. It could be cool. Wait, never mind. I don't <laughs> like he's so awkward. And he's saying, like, I want to you know, get a house somewhere I, in the country. Yeah, yeah I did always think it was interesting when Sirius is supposed to have this heartfelt moment. He's like, hey, I know. I don't know if you want to keep living with your parents. I totally understand. But you could live with me. It's like, you don't have a house, dude. I mean, we do learn that right. he has it. But at the time, it's like, what? Where am I going to stay? You were just in prison and you're on the run. I don't know. Do you even have a job? How are we going to buy food? <laughs> you are an ex-con, good sir. Can you get a job? In the book, I think Harry's like, yeah, I totally want to. In he the does. movie, he doesn't say anything. He says nothing. And that's like kind of heartbreaking, you realize later, because Sirius never knows if Harry actually likes him. Uh, I mean, I think later on, because they do yeah, have a little yeah, yeah. interaction in the fifth. But yeah, it is a little bit more heartbreaking. But <laughs> but yeah, oh, the freeze frame ending. What a quality end to the oh, quality yeah. film. Mm-hmm. So... 
Rex, as someone that hadn't read the books, what were your thoughts of just like watching the movie just as a movie? And then now that we've talked about a little bit of the things they changed, how do you feel now? I have seen it a couple times over the years. And like, I remember being like, wow, this movie's really cool when I first saw it. And as I got older, I started to see like, oh, this movie's fucking strange. Why is this rat just hanging around with this kid and he's a man? Why is everyone <laughs> turning to animals? I don't understand what's happening. And now that I've learned all of this extra stuff that I did not know before, it just makes me feel like I missed out on so much. Like, I didn't know. We're doing our like, job. I, they, <laughs> they've mentioned the Marauders. Not, they don't mention them, but they show them not like, even by later. Me. Do they even call them Marauders? Oh, no, they do call it the Marauders map at some point. I think the yeah. twins say it. But yeah, they don't even talk about it. Yeah, they call it the Marauders map, but they don't really talk about them themselves. Like, they nah. do show them later in, like, some, I can't remember which movie. But you don't really learn much about them. Just like, no. dude, I feel like I'm missing this whole extra layer of stuff where this could have been way more important four movies ago. But no, oh, you want to just <laughs> throw a rat man at me and say, oh, he's a traitor. <laughs> Like like you said, this would have been way better if it was a TV show. Like mm-hmm. if they make a Harry Potter show, I will definitely hop on that because they can definitely explore some of the stuff that I missed more. Because you, just you mentioning this cute little owl, what's his name? Pig Widgeon. I, I just I need to look up pictures of this guy now. <laughs> There's got to be artist renditions. He's just a tiny little boy. <laughs> it's probably the best little child. Oh, I need an owl friend. Oh, interesting. There's a picture of Rupert Grint with a tiny owl that's supposed to be Pigwidgeon. What? Maybe he shows up in the fourth movie. This is definitely movie four Rupert Grint because he has the worst hair. Yes, there you go. So maybe he shows up in movie four and I just don't remember. But yeah, just, it could be yeah, like brief scene at, at uh, the Weasley's house or something. Yeah, but he's, he's like the size of Ron's hand. He's Ugh. so small. Look how tiny this child yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, come around. He's, he's so cute. Oh my gosh, it is a tiny <laughs> owl. Oh my god. It's also a great fan art where it's a picture of Hedwig very angrily looking at a pig widgeon who has a full <laughs> smile and he's like a tenth of the size of Hedwig. Oh yeah, that's another that's what you're gonna miss out on with the fourth movie is uh Hedwig really doesn't like Pig Widgeon. Yeah, it gets and like because Pig Widgeon has to like stay at Harry's in his room for a bit to mm-hmm. I forgot. They why. have to send Pig Widgeon when they're writing to Sirius because yeah. people know who Hedwig is, so it's too obvious. Hedwig the famous uh, owl. Well, I mean, he's a big, <laughs> big, white, pretty owl, so it makes sense. It's that Garfield Nermal. <laughs> <laughs> That's their wow, relationship. Good reference. Oh, very good. <laughs> oh, man. So, Jackson, how do you feel about the film, especially now that we've dissected it? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely got some new revelations in dissecting it this time. You know, this this is the movie I've rewatched the most of any of them. Mm-hmm. It's my favorite book and my favorite movie. And I've never chosen to rewatch any of the others. I've just happened to be there when other people have. But this it's one, I, on TNT. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I hadn't seen it in a long time. So when I was rewatching ahead of it, you know, I think I had some of those adult realizations of the movie, like I did when I reread the books a little bit ago, of just sort of like, where are the adults sometimes? Like, why is this happening? Uh, I kept trying to remember like what my reactions were when I first saw it, because I remember I, I went with a bunch of friends to the midnight showing. This was the first movie, at least in my town, they did midnight showings for. Yeah, I think. Because before yeah. that, we used to skip school to see the early, like the 10 oh, a.m. showing. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, like the earliest one in our town. Um, and so we all went to like IHOP afterwards. And Classic, we just, as uh, you do. Yeah, we had to debrief on everything. Mm-hmm. And I remember all of our reactions immediately were like, this is so much better than the first two. Yeah. That was our initial reaction. <laughs> right. We were like, this was so fun. It would like, it was, it was great. And then we started talking about some of the things that were missing and some of the things that were there. Uh, I specifically remember all of us were like, Wait, was the headless hunt in this movie? Because oh, there's a there's a part where some ghosts just come in, and it's clearly the headless hunt who right. was not in the second movie. Right. Um. So it was like little stuff like that where we we were sort of were like, oh wait, I don't know. It's it's kind of what we said the whole time. This one's a little bit weird because it takes out stuff, it adds in stuff. That's mm-hmm. like kind of weird decisions, but ultimately, I don't know. I still like the aesthetic. Yeah, I think I appreciated first that this movie was only two hours and 20 minutes, whereas the first two were two hours and 40 minutes and change. Oh, wow. The first ones were both 240 and like 247 or something. They were really long. So I appreciate this one for being a little more digestible as a movie. But yeah, I think I think the problem is that 
the third book is so good yeah. that I do think this third movie is better than the first two movies, but I think the jump in quality from book two to book three is a lot higher than the jump in quality from movie two to movie three. And mm. I feel like I have a similar thought and what Rex is saying makes sense is that if you don't know all the extra stuff, you're like, yeah, this movie's pretty good. And then you learn all the extra stuff and then you think, oh my goodness, they missed out on so many cool yeah. things. I think ultimately the biggest gripe, which I've harped on is just the whole reveal of the, of the Shrieking Shack and the mm -hmm. Marauders and all like why everything's important because they don't get into the backstory enough, you lose out on that. And I think that's the biggest regret is that I thought that was JK's most interesting and creative writing at this point in the series. Yep. It was really clever. It's a really fun plot twist. It's fun to learn all the different things. You think Lupin's evil for a little bit. You don't even know what's going on with Pettigrew. You think like the whole buildup is a, you learn more about Pettigrew throughout the book. You think he's this good, innocent guy who died so early on tragically and he's supposed to be this great wizard. Mm -hmm. And you think serious the whole time. They really amp up how evil and scary this oh, dude yeah. is. And then that whole reveal is that everything is the exact opposite. And I think you lose all of that emotion in the movie. And that that is what really made me sad. But aside from that, I think it was well done. Visually, yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. The time turner stuff is fun. Buck Beak is cool. Like, all that's fun. The Quidditch scene isn't too drawn out. So I think that this movie is definitely an improvement for the first two because there are so many scenes in the in the first two that's just like, why is this going on so long? <laughs> and the third movie didn't do as much of that. It was just like, why are they adding this? Okay, whatever. Yeah. Even the things they add don't take that long. It's not like the Frog Choir is a 12-minute thing. It is just confusing. Oh, that'd be great, though. <laughs> <laughs> a, 12 a full song. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think all in all, a good movie, but I think this one is one of the most susceptible. I think this one... And then I'll have to see with the other books that get longer. I don't feel yeah. like the fourth was as bad. I think this fat that they trimmed from the fourth made the most sense. But mm -hmm. I feel like some of the fat that got trimmed out of this one didn't. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. But here we are. I think the acting was really good, though. Robbie Coltrane as Hagrid, he's really good. In he's this amazing. One. He's yeah. really solid. Does a good job of showing love for the squad and all that. I thought that was really good. We already talked about Emma Thompson as Trelawney. He's really fun. Amazing. Yeah, there's just, there's a number of the adult actors that were cast so, so well. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, several of them, I remember when I saw the movies for the first time, I was like, that is exactly how I pictured them in my head. Right. Some of them were not like that. <laughs> especially, a lot of the kids especially weren't. Um, But also just as I have now grown and gotten to know these actors in other capacities and in all the other work that they've done, I've just been like, wow, that's amazing that they were able to book them. Mm -hmm. And like, they really, really cast them really well. Yeah. So it was good. It was all good. So I think overall, yay. I feel better about this one than the first two. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still a little bit sad. But Thank you both for joining on and sitting down and talking to me about this movie. Jackson, if people want to find you, where can they do so? You can find me online at Jack is not a bird on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and also I have a, a book out called Sorted Grown Up coming out and Find My Place. There's lots of Harry Potter in it. I've gotten a few reviews saying there's too much Harry Potter. That, uh, <laughs> hey, so, pre everyone listening is going to be like, no. -uh. That, that's exactly, that's <laughs> why I said it to this audience of like, I think you will like it. <laughs> so you can find that. Just search it online or in your local bookstore. And then make sure you go on Goodreads and say just the right amount of Harry yes, Potter. Yes, please, with a five-star rating <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> and Rex, if people want to find you, where can they go? Oh, you can find me at Rex Testarossa on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok if you fancy that. R-E-X-T-E-S-T-A-R-O-S-S-A. -S 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 -A. And you can also find me on uh, my own podcast with my buddy Jonas, our buddy Jonas, at The Universe mm -hmm. According to Rex and Jonas. Yeah, I'm trying to get Jonas on to do a future movie episode because like you, he didn't read the books past oh. the second i think so oh, that'll boy. be another fun one but we'll see <laughs> if i can make that one happen but yeah thank you both so much for joining listeners thanks for listening and as they say in the wizarding world of harry potter before they write a letter to pigwidgeon who justice for pigwidgeon and ron for both of them <gasps> the wizard on are you all caught up on potterless and you don't know what to do do you want more potterless stuff well you're in luck because on patreon.com slash potterless i've made bonus episodes every month since the beginning so once per month, I've made a bonus episode, and it's ranged from audio at conventions I was a part of to me taking Harry Potter quizzes and stuff like that. If you want access to all of this instantly, once you sign up, you can go all the way back. It's hours of audio. Just go to patreon.com slash Potterless. Potterless is created by McShubert. It is hosted by McShubert. It is edited by McShubert. It is produced by McShubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Char Klauser, Lopu, Frank Giotto, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfelio, Abid Med, Rosemary, Dodge, Marie, Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivadonera, Camille Doc, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Rossanne Batamana, Nikki. 
Pizza Power, Taylor Armstead, Allie Madsen, Amelia Krause, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orca Girl, Vivian the Owl, Takari, Ront, Haley Hastings, Moster, Angelina Withred, Caitlin Sullivan, Grace Riggles, Raul Pineda, Inga Nodstadter, Mari Wynn, Alex Consilver, John Cocker, Noel Basile, Tao, Emily Tyrell, Robin Fernandez, Will Barrington, Liz Bigelow, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Enslin, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Donovan, Alicat29, Veronica Vartova, Lotta Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Mark, Lou Friday, J. Svensson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Tyler Latshaw, Summer Rathel, Heather Fleischman, Vera Cullitham, Carrie D. Baggison, Andrea Crock, Lisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Cameron Watkins, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Toothless Walnut, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Netta Atabani, Remy Fontaine, Sarah Shecker, Nona VMZ, Norozanowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia Addy, Brian, Jenny Campion, Nikki Harris, Cara Hamilton, Courtney Hemwood, Kine, Amanda Alfred, Sabrina, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Lindy Placky, Martha Madueno, Benjamin Desmond, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morrison, Stephanie Magnuson, Justine Wade, Aaron Richter, CJ Ochoco, Eileen Gazesh, Violet Sullivan, Kat Yowell, Lindsay Towning, Fielding Lee, Keegan Curran, Miranda Manning, Gail Ann, Mr. Folk, Adam Bryant, Christine Welton, Maya, Zachary Davis, Kieran, Heaven, Christy, Lily Leader, Williams, Wire Warrior 4976, Floor Sake, Sierra Skiars, Ford, Georgia, Itzel Ima Ayala, Peter Wyckoff, Candy Kane, Skyla Lily, Ed O'Ryan, Professor Threat, Kelsey Ulesian, Ellie Huskovchova, Lubin Maleo, Akinwande, Lena Karen, Daniel Fulkerson, Lee Lily, Elizabeth Christofferson, Abby, Luca Faccio, Michael David Yordi, Nice Earmuffs Potter, Did Your Mum Make Them For You? Cara Hoyer, Tiffany Cottrell, Kelly Otilio, Nadia Vansgard, Carrie Crumpler, Jamie Kingston, Camilo Garcia, Connie Bienkowski, Mary Mateel, Imo Sarah, Jennifer Went, Anastasia Blake, Jaden Allman, Nedry OS, Matt Barger, Riley Lane, Will Huser, Zephyr Lawrence, Brett Clausen, Samantha Lentz, Kayla M. Simino, Lauren Wainwright, Aurora Fruhoff, Emma Clark, Hermione Snape, Megan Dick, Out of Context 69, Liam McCormick, Melena Brandle, Marco Cepeda, L. Robertson, Hannah Zeters, Cordy Spilker, Victoria McCormick, Marie Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, Julie Walton, The Meadows Family, Jennifer From the Block, Anna Penalber Alvarez, Fake Valentine, Brianna Jordan, Karu Teru, Sarah Saunders, McKenna Tweedy, Six Awkward Nine, Anthony Ruiz, Peter Mina, Heather Langeal, Weekend of Dead Cat Ladies, Javi Guadalupe Trejo III, Darlene Kerr, Brad Harding, Thomas Chavara, Charlotte, Brianna Cusimano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Patrick Cribben, Chris U2, Alex Romano, Bugaboo, Jarl Sviven, Haley Logan, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Web design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanas. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, or reddit.com slash r slash potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com. For merchandise, you can go to bit.ly slash merch on. And for bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash potterless. If you want to help out the show, you can tell someone about it in real life or leave a review on the internet. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as I say, in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!